questions are open to any one of the physicians here. And again, you can ask an individual, but both uh, candidates will respond to it. So I see some questions out here. We'll give you the mic and you can ask. I'd like to know about the public service commission. Uh, that, that appears to be beyond politics for analytical uh, business decisions being made. But I'd like to have them explain how big the public service commission staff is and analytically how they approach some of those problems that they face with all the areas they break on. Um, if I understood your question, you you wonder, let me go over here so I can see you. Those lights are right straight in front of About the political uh, connection of the staff and everyone in the, in the commission. I'm thinking that you guys should be non political because you're looking at analytical decisions of what a utility charges people which should have no politics involved, which should be strictly business decisions. I got you. You hit the dead on. This is not a political office, even though it is elected politically. There's only, I think there's what, Gail, 10, 12 states in the union that elect. I think there's a dozen states in the union that elect uh, their commissioners. Um, Montana. For one, does not have any qualifications. If you can fog a mirror, you can run. Uh, as far as the decisions we make, I would say I, and I've been there four years now, almost four. I have never sat in a room making a decision where we ever got into a political discussion. It just never does come up. And the staff that we have. If you can tell what they are by talking to them, you're way better than I am. Because uh, you just can't tell. This is, this is an analytical. It is using the information given to us from the utility and from the consumer council. And then, of course, the witnesses brought in. And that's it. And that's all we need. When I was there, the staff was 39 people. It's the smallest agency in the state. Um, but you asked about how they make decisions and how they, we have a set of analysts, we have a set of attorneys. So, uh, and analysts specialize, they, they might specialize on electricity or natural gas or transportation or pipeline safety, etc. cetera. Um, they are very professional. They, we don't ever talk politics, that's, that's the truth. Um, and you are probably right, this probably shouldn't be a political position, um, but since it is, we're elected that way. Um, we make decisions based on the facts. I think I mentioned in my opening that we sit as um, judge and jury. It's quasi-judicial. And that means we have to consider all the information from all the parties in front of us. And we try to make the best decisions for our customers of the utility um, and also for the utility. We, we kind of sit in the middle. When I opened, I talked a little about that it's important to me that we look to our transitioning, new emerging energy future. And that's not just my opinion. That's the best, least expensive, most cost-effective energy out there. And so that's the best for the customer because they get the least expensive um, rates and it's also the best for our, our utilities. Thank you, Jill. Yes. Hello, this question Hello. is for Elsie. So my question for you is, do you believe that transgender students should be able to use the restroom of their choice in public schools? I appreciate that question. Um, I don't believe that the uh, Federal Department of Education should dictate anything like that. I think in our schools, with our 145,000 students that we have, and in our very rural communities, as well as the seven large districts that we have, that they're making a good determination right now. Our communities know who our children are. They know who those students are. And there should not be a top-down management of who we are. So it should be a local determination. It should be something that um, counselors, that uh, teachers can work around the students to 
make sure that those students reflect who they are and then they can be successful in school. So I believe, uh, if you can hear what I'm saying, it shouldn't be at the federal government that decides this, nor the federal department of education, but it should be our school districts here. And wrapped around making sure that everybody feels comfortable because school is a place where people should be. Uh, general question on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, our county and the city are much like Seattle and Washington State and Portland and Oregon. Uh, we are impacted by the uh, actions in Missoula, uh, good and otherwise. Uh, we support things, for example, the community park, the library bond issue that's coming up. Uh, we don't always get all the benefits, so how do we continue to represent folks out here in the wilderness who have, in many cases, very different views than those in Missoula? Yeah, thanks for the question. In my opening remarks, I mentioned my belief that I believe we are interconnected. And clearly, there ought not to be a one-size-fits-all approach everywhere in Missoula County. But the reality is, the last time I checked on map, the city of Missoula actually is in Missoula County. And uh, ought not to be seen as a thing unto itself, completely independent and the decisions that are made there clearly affect uh, outlying areas. And, and the point I make to people, and I live in Missoula, so I'll, I'll fess up to that, but the point I make to folks who uh, are my neighbors and friends within the city of Missoula is that you depend every bit as much at, on the goods and services that are created and generated in rural areas as the folks in rural areas depend upon the places where their goods and services uh, ultimately end up. So for me, a part of the, a big part of the equation uh, in learning what the needs are throughout Missoula County and re representing the entire, entire county is spending time throughout that county and listening, keeping an open door policy and making sure that uh, uh, I do my best to represent folks who live everywhere uh, throughout the county. So thanks for your question. Todd. Thank you. I understand your concerns. I'm actually the only candidate that's from Missoula County. Mike Davis said he lives in Missoula City. And uh, I have been hearing a lot of concerns about how these issues are affecting people in the outlying areas like I was talking about earlier. That's why I have started compiling a file on contacts within these outlying areas so I am able to contact these people in a more, I guess, uh, a feasible manner where where these people can gather their community and and discuss issues and come to me with those discussions. The voting base, as we know, in Missoula is much larger than the outlying areas. Well, as far as people come to the polls, so the issue is how we how do we get people to the polls and. That's why I'm running to represent people and with, like Dave said, an open door policy, open phone policy, and call me anytime so that I'm on the same page as everyone else. These are issues we need to discuss together and work out together. Thank you. My question is to the public service commissioners. I would like to know why the Northwest Energy electricity rates are as high as they are, and what they intend to do to rein in these expenses from on for Northwest Energy. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> so your electricity rates are set in a rate case. Northwestern Energy comes before the commission and asks almost always, but not always, for a rate increase. Once in a while they come and say, we're actually going to decrease, and especially on natural gas. Do you have natural gas? No. Okay, well, your natural gas bills, as people know, are way lower now than they were a few years ago. So but they, it's all just based on the facts. They come in and they present a case to us on what the cost of doing business is. And so you asked about electricity, but it's also about natural gas. and. And so the utility is bigger than electricity. And then we uh, analyze it. And the question that was previously asked by this gentleman, our staff does a ton of analyzing, especially they analyze 
what Northwestern says is the actual cost of doing business and how they arrived at that. And so then we have attorneys on both sides who argue it, et cetera. The best way to keep the lid on electricity costs is for us to choose the least expensive root source of power. And right now, as I've said a couple times, the least, not the least expensive, but solar is far, I mean, wind is far, far less expensive than coal or even hydro. And so we do look at that and we do have a decision to make in that. We do have an opportunity to help the procurement of resources for Northwestern. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, we're, we're looking at the laws of the nation of the state. The state, because they are a, a regulated monopoly, they are entitled, and we have the obligation by statute of guaranteeing that they will have adequate resources, both to maintain the, the lines that they have, deliver the power that they're saying that they're going to, but they also have to have enough margin at the end to attract investors to when they're doing growth. That, that's building the statute. We have no options when it comes to that. One of the reasons that Northwestern Energy prices are so high at this moment in time, back when coal strip was purchased, and this has nothing to do with coal, if you don't buy like coal, it doesn't make a difference. But when the purchase is made, the company is entitled to a return on that particular investment. But their net return, not, not the debt side, only on the equity side. At this point in time, they were, they were high priced. And the coal strip was high priced. That's why the power coming out of generation is only $15.60 per megawatt. But the ownership of the plant is for the okay. uh, You mentioned about cost effectiveness, but I am also concerned about environmental impact. And you also mentioned about pipeline safety, and I know some of us don't do this any such thing. So I'm wondering how much in your job does safety and environmental impact enter into decisions as well as just cost effectiveness? Uh, thank you. So uh, clearly, environmental issues are at the forefront of our new energy future. We're looking because customers are demanding it, legislatures are demanding it. The perfect example is um, coal strip units one and two, which are about to be decommissioned. Nothing to do with the Public Service Commission, but a lot to do with the fact that they're expensive unreliable and not able to be modernized to the levels that are required by the current EPA. So we can't do it in any, any cost effective way. So, and why, and what's driving that is the legislatures in Washington and Oregon, which by the way, whole, um, Washington and Oregon wholly own those two units of coastal. Not Montana doesn't own any of them. And there, Legislatures are being, are, dri are being driven by public opinion, saying, well, we don't want power from um, energy that is not clean and not reliable. And so they have made a decision to no longer purchase power from coastal. So I, yes, environmental issues play into our decisions, um, although that's not a particular PSC decision, but it makes a difference where our power comes from. And if the least expensive power is also the cleanest power, that is the only way to go. Thank you. Now, if I understood the question, you were talking about coal strip one and two, about how that's going to affect race, whatever. Environment. It was a the environmental impacts of pipelines, <coughs> pipeline safety, pipeline environmental impact. Oh, I, what I was hearing on the answer was coming from coal strip about the ownership of it. Uh, we have we have a staff of three on pipeline safety. Um, the uh, and actually have two rail safety people working with the feds. We're adding a third one uh, for the uh, safety on the rail cars. Get that together. But uh, I misunderstood the question. I thought it was all aimed towards a, you know the 
the ownership of the the uh, coaster one and three or one and two. Well, English. I just want to make sure I had the question right. Was not the question about the safety of pipelines? That was part of it. Yeah. Yes, I did ask about that. Like, what can they really do about the safety of pipelines, but also how much, how much the environmental impact plays into the decision to oh. make? That's what I was asking. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, again, the Public Service Commission has nothing to do with that portion. We do spot check the uh, pipeline safety, but the feds have a major role in that. Thank you. Uh, so I live in House District 94, so this is a question for the House District 94 candidates. Uh, currently, the RNC platform supports the sale of public lands. Do you support the sale of public lands? On the flip side of that point, what is your biggest criticism of the DNC platform? So um, I do not support the sale of public lands. They're public lands. I grew up recreating on them. And that's why many of us stay here in Montana is because they're so great. So we need to maintain access to public lands and make sure that that access isn't impeded by any laws that are passed in the legislature, be it intentionally or not. We also need to make sure we fund the agencies that are supposed to be managing those lands because if we don't fund them, they are not going to be able to adequately manage what we have access to. And um, any transfer of the state lands to federal jurisdiction will, will result in a great uh, cut of money coming to the state from federal taxes that we already pay that helps manage those lands. It will also cause an increase of over $10 million to our state budget. So that means increased taxes. So when you hear um, transfer of state lands or transfer of federal lands to the state, it sounds nice but it's, it's not. It's a big hit in the pocketbook of the state. It's an increase in your taxes. And eventually when localities like Missoula or Sealy Lake aren't able to manage those lands, they will be sold off and they would be privatized. So we would lose access to those lands. So I absolutely do not support that. And, and then you asked what was the um, uh, criticism of the DNC platform? You, have any of the DNC? you know, I think that those platforms are nice and they're written on a lot of paper and there's a lot of words there but that um, we are all individuals and we all may be moderate or liberal. I'm more moderate than most. I work successfully across the aisle equally with Republicans and I think that we don't have to ascribe to the platforms. So I don't think we should be held to them specifically. Thank you. Uh, I've definitely, uh, as I've gone out and talked to people, heard people ask about public lands, where you stand. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously the issue, you know, when you pose it that way, do you support the sale of private lands, or uh, of public lands, or rather? Uh, obviously, I wouldn't support, uh, you know, any of the governments coming in and selling our, our public lands and making them private for uh, any such reason. But really, the, uh, the issue, as I understand it, is whether those lands should be transferred from a federal management to a state management. Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the federal government could sell the land and the state government could sell the land, but, uh, you know, without living in that land of, of hypotheticals, um, uh, certainly there are pros and cons of moving uh, federally managed land to a state uh, uh, managed land. And, and if you look at our state today, do we have the resources to manage those federally funded uh, or federally managed lands? Probably not in its current current state. Obviously, the federal government is using dollars to uh, thank you is using dollars to manage those lands. And, and you know, would we be able to adequately take all those lands, uh, adequately have enough funds to uh, to to support and sustain them? That's a good question. That's something that needs to be looked into. Uh, thank you again, but um, but I don't know if uh, you know if I quite address your your question. But uh, you know, we shouldn't be selling off public lands to private individuals. Uh, just willy nilly. So. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this is a question I would love to hear all the legislative candidates answer, but considering that might not be possible, uh, maybe just starting over on the left with House District 96. Uh, recently in Missoula, an ordinance was passed prohibiting the sale or transfer of guns between private individuals without first getting a background check on those weapons. I was wondering uh, first whether or not candidates support that ordinance or don't support that ordinance, and then two, if they think that they might be involved uh, with either trying to make sure that ordinance stays as it is or changing that ordinance or rendering it on the way. Thank you. 
Thanks for the question. Um, I was actually on city council for four years and when that issue came up, and I voted against that ordinance uh, for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which it violates state law, and it's pretty clear that it violates state law. Um, unfortunately, that ordinance got resurrected and was recently passed, like you mentioned. Um, there's a state law that, that very quite clearly says local governments don't have uh, the ability to regulate the sale of firearms. Um, the city attorney really never said that they did. He said it was a gray area. Uh, the state attorney general weighed in and said uh, it's not a gray area. The ordinance is illegal. And I'm pretty sure that uh, it won't take very long uh, for that process to play out uh, and for uh, the Missoula City Council to have to take a step back uh, and realize where they have jurisdiction and where they don't. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I am endorsed and have an A rating from the NRA and the Montana Shooting Sports Association. Uh, I'm a hunter, uh, fisherman, outdoorsman, uh, love spending time on public lands, um, shooting for both sport, hunting, uh, and recreation, uh, and uh, I'll be a tireless defender of the Second Amendment. Thank you. Who's the other guy? <laughs> I'm the other guy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Andrew Pearson, House District 96. Um, I agree with Adam. I actually think that the ordinance will be preempted by uh, state law. Um, I think that there are good intentions. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think that it's just practicable within the framework of uh, comprehensive state regulation of firearms. Um, I also am a strong Second Amendment defender. Um, I'm proud. Uh, you know, could have uh, you know, carried a M4 uh, by my side for you know, years at a time overseas to stand up for our constitutional rights, all of them. And, uh, and I think one of the great things about Montana is uh, you know, this is one of those areas where they, we have an 80% agreement. Uh, we have uh, a right to bear arms, and I think there are a lot of out-of-state groups that are funded predominantly by out-of-state money that try to uh, paint certain folks that um, refused to take orders in a certain light. And uh, that's why I was really proud that we passed last session a complete uh, overhaul of our campaign finance laws that requires disclosure. So when groups like Americans for Prosperity come in and try to uh, you know, spread misinformation, they're required to disclose who's funding those attacks. So working together, we're going to be able to keep this a great state. And uh, thanks for the great question. So my question is, um, over the last several legislative sessions, there appear to be always um, some sort of a threat from uh, groups to divert tax money designated for schools <coughs> to charter schools and private schools. So um, I'm one of those people that um, really appreciate paying my taxes. I'm proud to do that to support my fire departments, my police departments, my sheriff. I don't think tax is a dirty word, but I also want to be sure that um, that state funding for public schools is uh, secure for public schools, as in our state constitution. Could any of our state house districts um, representatives um, address how they would support uh, public funding for public schools? Here's the problem. You open it to everybody. We don't have time for the wall. Have to get time. Pick a section. <laughs> Or, or possibly uh, Elsie Arnson, who is uh, public education. Oh, thank you. Um, as a state, uh, how do I say, a state representative, and also as a state senator currently, we've been in the legislature for 12 years mm -hmm. and 23 years as a public school teacher. Diversion is the main part of the discussion. There is one pot of money, but we have so many children in our community. So it is about strengthening public school and using that very precious tax dollar that all of us pay into this. But it is not a matter of diversion. It's lifting everybody up within that. We have 30% mobility within our school that come in and out of homeschool, that come in and out of all different other systems of school besides our strong public. 92% of our children are in public school. So you have tax dollar just like it goes to the fire department and like it goes for safety. This goes for education. So it's extremely important that we keep our system, our large system that we have in public school, as strong as it possibly be. Giving it to local control so we have school leaders 
that will be able to decide on what's best used for those kids that are in there. We are not any other state in the union when it comes to what a charter might be. To me, what I'm looking at is more flexibility and more decision-making happening at the local level. And that's where it needs to be. Right now, we have state charters, two of them. One is in Bozeman, and it's about flexibility with time on staff as well as time with children. The other part is a program that's in Libya and Troy. So I'm looking forward to seeing what these public state charters look like. This question is for the candidates for county commissioners. Um, when I got here 11 years ago, I had a situation where Surf that Stone was delinquent on their taxes. Now, 11 years later, we have the same situation, empty green delinquent on their taxes. Obviously, there's been a lot of things that have happened in the last 11 years with the closing of the mill site, empty green digging it over, promising development that never happened, and now, of course, the possibility of the Superfund site out there. Uh, any insight on where the school district or the fire uh, district needs to go and what you foresee with happening with them to agree? Great question. I, I don't have any great answer uh, right now as far as how to uh, get those funds shaken loose from Andrew mm -hmm. Green. Uh, clearly, mm -hmm. it's, it's a problem. Uh, and it's most unfortunate that the community is suffering the result of some uh, poor business management and poor decisions by uh, corporate interests like that. I think one of the things that we can do and that the county commissioners can and needs to do is lobby hard that if indeed the potential potentially responsible parties in M2 Green are not going to um, step up and clean up that site out there, we need to lobby hard that it gets on the national priorities list and I think it's designated as um, a super fun site to get it cleaned up and get it prepped in a way that can attract business and regardless of the bad taxes, get some paying taxpayer uh, uh, out there that can help support this, uh, this community. Hi. I think the outstanding tax debt is something that we're going to have to push for as a community. We're just going to have to push on those guys to come clean with that, the debt. And you know, I'm, I'm from Bar, and we kind of experienced the same thing when the mill got out there shut down. And we started a community action to encourage new business to take the place of, of the mill. And so far, we've got four businesses in there. And that's what I'd like to push for the old Smurfit location out here, is try and at least get some kind of good, productive business in there so we can pull more tax revenue out of it again. And, and like I said, pressure the, the tax debt and see if we can get that, at least some of that pay in the meantime. I feel like I have a Montana question because I know the Constitution would have an initiative process, but it looks to me like the initiative process a lot of times gets taken over by a special interest group who can afford um, to pay petition uh, people to get out and sign, get petition signed. And so I'm just curious to see um, what the legislators take on what time Mr. Chia, um, and ask him what what he thinks that there might be solutions. Because I really think that the initiative process ends up to be a lot of emotional, a lot of emotional voting, and so that's an explain for the most advertising. Um, is, are any of the legislators thinking about, you know, improving this process? Mr. Solomon and Mr. G. I'd like to ask you. Have answer that question? I certainly think it's the legislators, legislature's responsibility to take a look at the initiative process and to make sure that it's being uh, effectively used by the citizens of Montana. That said, the initiative process is in our Constitution. Uh, over the years, I've seen initiatives good and bad. I voted for some, voted against others. I expect to do that on the ballot this fall. And I, I think the initiative process, by and large, has served the state well in terms of surfacing issues that a significant number of Montanans feel are important and that the people should vote on if the legislature is not going to act. And I would, be, I would certainly be opening to listening to ideas about how we make sure the process is fair, how we make sure that signature gathering is done in a way that is 
fair and open. Uh, but undermining the process itself is something I would oppose because I do think that it is an effective check on the legislature and an effective vehicle for the people to express their sentiments about important issues to the state. Thank you, Tom. Ben? Thank you. A um, couple separate issues there, but because it is in the Constitution, it takes a considerable amount of work to change something like that in the legislative process. But uh, I agree with Tom. It's in there. It should be utilized. It's a great check for the people of Montana. If they don't agree with what the legislature did, it gives them an opportunity. With, I have not heard that there is any uh, rumblings out there to work on that. But if the people of Montana want us to work on it, they need to tell us so that we can. This is what the whole issue is about. Why we go door to door to find out these things. If people are upset about things, we need to know why, then we'll start working on, on uh, solutions for these issues. So it's nice to have these things brought up so that we can uh, have them on our radar and start looking at them. Thank you. So I'm on school board in Prince County, and I had a question about the infrastructure bills that were in the legislature last session. Um, we had run a, we were on the list of all these schools grants to be funded for infrastructure, and that was not passed, and therefore we had to run the building reserve levy. We are almost seven hundred thousand dollars in arrears with property taxes with M two green. So I want to know, with Mr. Pearson and Mr. Hertz, how they would vote if that is to come up again in this legislature first infrastructure funding for schools. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, my understanding is that the, the governor's infrastructure bill um, that ultimately lost by one vote in the House did not actually include the quality schools uh, program that you're talking about. It included special interest handouts like a $30 million museum in Helena, um, Romney Hall in Bozeman, um, but didn't actually include quality schools, if I understand it correctly. Uh, my father is in the legislature. He represents uh, House District 12 up in Polson, and um, he was one legislator that uh, worked with a group uh, that, that tried to get consideration of some amendments that would have uh, provided uh, school roofs, uh, boiler systems, statewide, throughout the state. Um, and, and it was a, an amendment that wouldn't even be considered um, by the, the Democrats in the legislature and uh, the Republicans that crossed over to join them, as well as the governor. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, that it was an ugly process, the fact that they had a pre-negotiated backroom deal and, and didn't want to debate that out in the open. And it's not the kind of process that I look forward to having. Uh, there was also talk about uh, them trying to buy votes by throwing a, a you know, school roof uh, for one particular school in the bill, uh, you know, if, if that particular legislature would vote for the package. Uh, and luckily they held, held strong on that and didn't do that. Uh, so I think it's important to fund real infrastructure like roads, bridges, and schools. Uh, I don't think special interests like uh, Museum and Elena are true infrastructure. And thanks for that question. This is a really, probably one of the most important things the legislature is going to do next session. So it's really important that everybody pay attention to what's going on. Because millions of dollars for schools was in that infrastructure package. And, you know, it, it is flat out untrue that this was some sort of partisan special interest thing. Because, I mean, the infrastructure bill was supported by the Republican Speaker of the House. It was supported by nearly every member of the Montana Senate except for maybe five senators. Um, so it sailed out of the Senate with almost unanimous support. It headed over to the House, um, supported by the Republican Speaker of the House. It had all kinds of critical funding for Eastern Montana that has been poorly underfunded for infrastructure. And a small fringe, because, because it required bonding, it required a supermajority of the House to pass it. And really, a, little, a small fringe of the state house blocked the bill, the funding, the critical funding for the entire state of Montana. If you want to look at what dysfunction looks like when you introduce partisanship into basic bread and butter governance, look at that debate on the infrastructure bill. It's, it is what Washington, D.C. has been doing for years, and it's what some legislators are trying to bring into our state legislature. It has to be rejected. We have to look at the facts. You're entitled to your own facts. I hate your own opinions, but you're not, you're not your own facts. We, we look at that bill, look who is supporting it, and we've got to get it done in that session. It's critical, critical for our schools, especially. 
Clay, Frenchtown, Bill Bronx. So I just had another question for Lance Arnson about um, preschool for the state and if you would support the early edge proposal from Thank you for that. So preschool, preschool has been a discussion in the legislative process. I have been going around so many different school districts in my journey in the statewide office, and that's what I do. I ask, so if it's Christmas, what would you like? And I can tell you, a lot of communities are doing preschool with what they have, maybe two days or so in rural communities, and some are putting preschool and putting dollars into that. Those three and four year olds right now are not getting paid by the A and B amount for them. But this office is about priority. And if I am talking to uh, school districts, preschool and getting a whole new cohort of young minds into our buildings, and we just had the infrastructure discussion. Our infrastructure is not where it needs to be, so having a three and four year old at this point in time is probably not on the top list of the priority. It is about teacher retention and recruitment. It's making sure the number one thing that affects our kids is having a qualified educator right there. The other part is infrastructure. A grant program, if I could just step for the last comment was, a grant pro program is not stable funding. You as a trustee want to make sure that there's funding going to be there not just for the next biennium, but for that next group of kids that are going to be in your building. It would be very unfair for you to go ahead and have to write out a grant, not get it, and then have to write, rewrite another one when your needs are very real. There are very, I've got about four different ideas, and there are three bills in the hopper right now on a secure streamline of funding. Thank you. What about there? ship has sailed a little bit on this so sometime this fall the commissioners the sitting commissioners will be uh, adopting a plan that I fully intend to do my best to uh, implement because it has this is drug on for a long time and we need to bring some level of closure saying that does not mean to imply that I agree with everything that is going to be in that plan if I had to do it over again I would probably have taken a little different course of action. Being a historian, I'm very concerned about the, the cultural aspects of the fair and the, the historic uh, uh, footprint of the fairgrounds, if you will, and will do my best within the confines of the existing plan to try to be sensitive to those concerns. But it's the classic question of a uh, representative form of government where what goes to the people by way of a referendum versus what is decided administratively by uh, the elected officials. In this case, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going forward as is, and I, I, don't, not, I don't think I would support uh, a referendum at this point in time about uh, whether the fairground stays at its current location or goes somewhere else, because I think we'll have a huge can of worms that will take a long, long time to close up again. Well, you know, being from Missoula my whole life, I, I'm pretty partial to the Missoula County Fairgrounds. And I'm extremely partial to what used to be the racetrack. You know, I, I hear it all the time. Ships sail, hands are tied. We can do something about it, I, I still think. Um, in my opinion, the fairgrounds should be where they're at. We should quit spending money on these so-called plans that nothing that aren't getting okay by the public. We need the public to stand up and come forward 
and make a decision that these people have to stand with and that myself would have to stick to. The, the overspending on, on these plans seems to be, to me, a way to build revenue for themselves personally. I personally don't support what the new plan is for the fairgrounds and would work hard to restore the fairgrounds back to the way they used to be. My grandfather actually at one point owned the property where the fairgrounds are located. So it goes much deeper for me than just going there since I was a kid. I think it should be maintained the way it used to be. Um, so I was trying to speak with these two gentlemen over here. Um, I work with the uh, French Town Community Coalition um, about substance abuse prevention. And I'd like to hear their take on um, legalizing or um, not legalizing marijuana. Well, I think uh, this year, I don't know if you're talking about medical marijuana or medical marijuana. I, I mean, it's in the voters' hands in, uh, on November 8th this year, so I think that's going to be a pretty clear-cut referendum on whether or not marijuana uh, should be essentially re-legalized in the state of Montana because, as you know, voters voted in 2004 by referendum. Uh, it was changed by the state legislature. It's coming back for referendum. Uh, I think that's going to be a pretty decisive question that the voters will be able to answer soon. Um, we, so we sort of want to more know like, Did you actually you want us to answer the question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm for it. Um, I uh, I was really I learned a lot from my uncle when he came back from Vietnam. Um, he struggled with PTSD, and medical marijuana turned his life around in a way that uh, other medications, other therapy didn't. Um, I think it is absolutely ridiculous in a state that is as libertarian as Monday. Every, every, every Montana, regardless of what your political party is, has about 10% of, you're about 10% libertarian. And, um, you know, so I think in a state like this, to watch, you know, other states <coughs> nearby, you know, it, move in the opposite direction, and meanwhile the legislature is sort of ignoring the world of people by, you know, implementing really, art, you know, string, stringent regulations on medical marijuana, depriving, people are suffering from cancer, people are suffering from all kinds of things. Um, for, for no good reason. Um, so, so I look forward to see uh, how the voters vote. I think that we're going to pass it. And I think in the long run, it's, it's going to be the right thing for Montana. Thank you. Any more hesitants that are willing to bust through and ask their question? All right. I have one uh, that just came up. I might as well ask it. Uh, and it's same guys. Adam uh, and and uh, Andrew, only because you both mentioned in your opening uh, discussion that uh, infrastructure was important to you, one of your key things. So I'd like to ask each one of you, what do you, if you had your choice, what are the two most high priority infrastructure projects you support? Uh, well, I don't, I don't have any particular special interest or, or pet project uh, in infrastructure, you know, that's in particular importance to me. Um, you know, I'd say after serving on the Missoula City Council, there's a, just a multitude of needs uh, in terms of infrastructure needs, whether it's uh, roads, bridges, sidewalks. I mean, we've been waiting 20 some years for the Russell Street Bridge to get built. So there's certainly some pressing issues. And I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest, the best answer to your question is that uh, it takes 100 representatives, really 150, uh, the Senate and the House included, uh, to bring the priorities that they hear from uh, their local voters. Uh, and, and, and bring those forward to the legislature and, uh, you know, really weigh the projects and their importance. Um, I haven't had folks, when I'm talking to voters on the door, specifically name particular infrastructure projects, um, but I'm certainly very familiar with infrastructure needs uh, in the Missoula community. Um, haven't heard a lot about it out in the Frenchtown area, uh, but I'd love to hear from folks and, and hear what their important projects are. Uh, number one would be grants to schools like Frenchtown. Uh, French Town High School. I mean, we've got to we've got to make sure that the state starts returning back to what, the way we. Thirty years ago, the state funded a much higher share of the public education budget than we do today, and the result, the consequence of the state neglecting schools is that the, the share falls on local property taxpayers. There's a reason why your property taxes are going up, and that's that's a key reason why. That's one. So the second priority is high tech. Montana, I can't believe it, but we've got some of the worst access to high-speed broadband in the country. 
Um, and if you if you want to bring, if you want to talk about for the first time in human history, we can compete here in Montana for any job anywhere in the world. We've got to make public investments to make sure that we're keeping up with the rest of the world in high tech infrastructure. And I think we can work together. That's bipartisan, and we should focus on that. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands up there, which means we'll draw the evening to a close. So I first want to, well, I want to thank you guys first. It's great to see you people coming out here and having having interest in your own future here. Uh, it's just, it's super. And uh, go Grizz. <laughs>